Welcome. My name is Scott Malone, and I'm an editor in charge for general news in the northeastern United States for Reuters, and I'll be your mon moderator today. Uh, this event is a collaboration of the forum at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Reuters. The deaths of Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, and others during encounters with law enforcement have shown a spotlight on racial injustice in the United States. This forum will examine how disparities within the law and criminal justice system negatively affect health. We will also look at, the, at how the role of race interacts with neighborhood environments, educational and employment opportunities, public policy, and other factors that lead to poorer health. Uh, at this point, I'd like to uh, briefly introduce our panelists today. Uh, starting remotely, we have uh, Governor Jim Doyle, former governor of, uh, and attorney general of Wisconsin. Also remotely, uh, Felton, Dr. Felton Ells, who is a professor of human behavior and development emeritus at the Department of Social Behavioral Sciences at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Uh, and then here, to my immediate right, we have David Harris, managing director of the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice at Harvard Law School. Uh, Nancy, Dr. Nancy Krieger, Professor of Social Epidemiology at the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Harvard Chan School. And then at the end of the table, Dr. David Williams, Professor of Public Health at the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences, also here at the Harvard Chan School. And um, with that, we'd like to welcome our viewers online, as well as those who have gathered in one of the auditoriums here in the school and attendees of the Health Equity and Leadership Conference at the Harvard Medical School, who will also be watching us on the live screen there. And we'd like to welcome our uh, local Massachusetts State Representative, Jeffrey Sanchez, who's joined us today. Um, if you have questions for the panelists and you're watching online or following along in another medium, you can email your questions to uh, the forum at hsph.harvard.edu or tweet them to at forum HSPH using the hashtag, hashtag health and race, all one word. Uh, you can also participate in the live chat, that discussion that's happening on the forum site right now. Uh, we'll start with a clip from Reuters News that shows some of the protests that have happened across the United States and that continue to be mountain, mounted in response to these deaths. They marched in their thousands in cities across the U.S., the latest backlash against police killings of unarmed black Americans. These were the scenes in New York where more than 10,000 turned out in Manhattan. I feel like there's a lot going on in society right now that are putting black men into one monolith and seeing us all as one person instead of seeing us as somebody's son, somebody's uncle, somebody's brother, somebody's husband. It's not just um, a racial problem in my eyes. I think it's a problem all across the board. I think that the whole Militarization, militarization of the police state's a big problem and it needs to be stopped. In Washington, D.C., they gathered in Freedom Plaza before starting a three-mile march to rally in front of the U.S. Capitol. The mother of 12-year-old Tamia Rice, shot and killed last month in Cleveland, was among them. And to all the families that's experiencing the same pain as me, we will have justice of a God of our understanding. Great. And uh, with that, we'll open up our uh, conversation with some comments from uh, Governor Doyle. Governor, go ahead. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm really uh, pleased to be back uh, remotely at the Harvard School of Public Health uh, and uh, for this opportunity. I was governor for two terms, eight years in Wisconsin. I was an attorney general for 12 years as the state's chief law enforcement officer, and I spent three two-year terms as the local elected prosecutor in Dane County where Madison is located in Wisconsin. My first thought about this topic is just how intractable this issue is. I think back to my days as a district attorney in the late 1970s and early 80s and that this was a, a big area of discussion. In the 90s there were many incidents that uh, brought it to the fore again and we went through massive training of Wisconsin law enforcement officers on cultural diversity and understanding. And here we are years later watching these events happen. To me, uh, and we'll hear a lot from the experts here who I really appreciate being part of, but I see a real lack of charity in this criminal system as it applies to African American people. And I know there will be a lot of talk about economy here but to me, this is one of the issues that in many ways comes down really at, to race. Uh, ask any affluent African-American person about some incident that they've had with the police department and you will always hear something coming back 
uh, of the kind of contact that they have had that seems so foreign to most white uh, Americans. So when I see a young kid in a juvenile court, as I did many years ago when I was in those courts all the time, 15 years old, sagging pants, adopting kind of a cool attitude, I see a scared boy. But often if that boy is black, he is seen as a threat. Uh, and if he is white, he is seen as uh, somebody who we hope we can maybe get back on the right track. I see that lack of uh, uh, in the in the stops of police. Um, I've, now that we see so many more films of these, the the stop with a uh, of a fairly minor traffic incident is often a fairly aggressive, hostile kind of contact on the street if the driver is black, and if it's white, it's often a very gracious and uh, the police officer being very um, uh, 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 being very reasonable about how to handle it. We see the incident with Professor Gates and just the, the inability of much of white America, I think, to be able to put themselves in another person's shoes and see what does that feel like? How, can you, how, how, uh, how does that feel to, to have this happen in your, home, in your own home? I have seen films of police officers uh, thinking they're being culturally sensitive, calling a 40-year-old uh, African-American person man throughout the entire discussion as if that's how we all chat with each other and that's the kind of cultural training. So that's my really great concern that after all these years there's still this this uh, aggressiveness uh, and of course there are many many exceptions to this and many wonderful police officers but generally a young uh, not only young a African-American person is seen as a threat and a white person is often seen as somebody who's in a bad circumstance, and, and this is what they're going to do. Um, let me finally um, say I've spent a lot of years with law enforcement, um, and I really believe that that this that yet we just it's just something you have to stay at all the time. But there is no doubt having more African American police officers and prosecutors and judges to me in the long run is what you do to try to change this. I was there in the Madison Police Department uh, as a DA when they began to finally recruit a significant number of African-American officers. And I'll just tell you, the use of the N-word, while it's hardly stopped, it was diminished dramatically simply by having African-American uh, officers. So I don't mean to be this despairing, and I'm sorry to set it off on this tone, but I've, it's been a long time, and this just seems to be one of these issues when I see that clip of the of the Cleveland incident, to me that you couldn't have a a more dramatic incidence about just lack of about how they approach a small boy in such an aggressive uh, manner. But without that kind of dramatic shooting, that kind of aggressive contact is happening all the time, and it leaves in the, the recipient even as the traffic incident occurs and you move away. The person who's leaving after that contact with the police is, feels humiliated, debased, uh, uh, as opposed to the person Clearly. who uh, was treated in a much more respectful way. So Clearly. thank you. And de definitely something that's been brought to the fore in, in recent months. Um, and with that, we'd like to turn it over to, uh, to Dr. Harris to, to weigh in some. <clears throat> well, thank you. I, I want to start by saying it's a pleasure to be here and uh, among these colleagues and uh, with uh, all of you online and in the audience. I hope to provide some context for understanding an American criminal justice system defined by racial disparity, deeply rooted in our country's history, but more recently di directly flowing from the war on drugs. Although the original battleground of this war was prevention and uh, addiction treatment, the weapons and tactics were rapidly turned over to law enforcement with an emphasis on arrest and punishment. This single gear policy largely concentrated on poor communities and communities of color had two devastating effects. First, it channeled resources away from the real public health issues affecting those communities. And second, it exacerbated those issues by adding stress, trauma, and social disruption. We may think of the war of drugs as over because we don't hear the phrase anymore. But we're left, and we have left and left right wing coalitions calling for a new smart on crime strategies. But the war lives on in lingering images and biases embedded in our consciousness, language, and conceptions of community. Over the past four decades, we have seen the media portray black communities as dens of criminality, 
We have seen social scientists demonize young black men as super predators. And today, we have police practices guided by a broken window strategy that gives cover to intense police contact in selected neighborhoods. We have seen federal, state, and local policies that reward stops, arrests, and prosecutions by creating actual financial incentives. Again, these incentives rob the affected communities of resources more effectively devoted to public health issues, including addiction treatment, violence prevention, as well as healthier and safer environments. Our public health arena has embraced the reality of the social determinants of health, but our public spending priorities remain mired in the legacy of the war on drugs. The net result is a culture of punishment at the root of the system of mass incarceration with which we now live. Over the past two decades, we have also seen significant strides in understanding and documenting the operation of unconscious associations between African American and negative attitudes and behaviors with actual animal associations often reflected in journalistic accounts of criminality. One of the more interesting ideas about the operation of implicit bias uh, forwarded by Banaji and Greenwald is that these biases operate in the positive as well as the negative. It is not surprising to think that we have affinities for those like us or for those for whom we have positive associations. Our biases serve, therefore, not only to exclude but to include. We see this in the response to today's drug ep epidemic, which increasingly affects white communities. Here in Massachusetts, as elsewhere in the country, we are plagued by the striking increase in the use of opiates, both prescription drugs and heroin. Our public officials are rightly alarmed and identify this, uh, identify this uh, as nothing less than a public health crisis, promising to attack the epidemic with a multifaceted approach that shows the kind of sensitivity we would expect from people whose friends, relatives, and neighbors have been affected. Fitting as this response is, however, it is also starkly different from the way in which the war on drugs has been prosecuted against communities of color. The current epidemic is portrayed through the lens of white individuals victimized by drugs via overprescribing physicians, unaware parents, or peer pressure with calls for social work and health interventions. I spoke earlier of our being stuck in a single gear, the punishment gear. If we see our justice, not criminal justice, but justice system as a bicycle, we can think of trading that old single gear bike for a newer, more agile 21 speed bike. We need to learn from our response to the opiate scourge and commit to a system with enough flexibility to respond with the various forms of justice available, one that includes some critical public health interventions that lessen dependence on the punishment gear. We believe it is essential to make the formal declaration of the end of the war on drugs and the end of the war on our communities and launch a concerted and dedicated effort to repair the devastation wrought by four decades of warfare. We also believe this plan must include a commitment to form a community justice, to a form of community justice, which the people affected by the policies have a voice. Thank you. Wonderful. And uh, with that, we'll turn it over uh, to one of our, our other remote guests, uh, Tony Earls, Dr. Earls. Thank you, Scott. I'd like my colleagues in Boston to know that I've opened a satellite to the school in New Orleans. That's where I'm coming from. So you're welcome to come. <laughs> I'd also like to say that uh, I've really been inspired by our students in the last two months. And I think that this conversation that we're having is a direct result of the activism and the commitment that our students are showing. So congratulations, student body. Uh, let me be very brief in telling you about some of the research and concerns I have that my research sort of considers neighborhoods as social units of analysis. And to study neighborhoods, we've gone beyond race composition, economic composition, educational background, to look at how people in neighborhoods relate to each other. Uh, we've measured characteristics such as trust and reciprocity and willingness to intervene into the lives of young people in a constructive way and come up with it with a measurable uh, standard of what 
community life is like in terms of exposing children to risk or protecting them from uh, bad environments or bad circumstances. Uh, when we discovered collective advocacy in the, 19, in the late 1990s, Janet Reno was the attorney general and insisted that the research be conveyed to police departments around the country to inform community policing policy. So one of the things I've done is to follow the research and the impact of community policing uh, as it has become uh, orthodox training and uh, integrated into policing practice. There are very few cities that are documenting the effects of community policing uh, in detail. Philadelphia is an exception where Jerry Radcliffe at Temple University is working with the police department and with public health officials to monitor the impact of community policing in small neighborhood units. So they've reorganized the policing units so that officers are assigned over many years to small units of four or 5,000 people. Uh, in unpacking collective efficacy, you really get to citizenship, I mean, good citizenship, uh, people's willingness to intervene. And it's a leverage point using co community policing, but also using civics education in schools and involving children in positive activities in the neighborhoods. Um, and so I think that the solution to our stagnant problem that the governor related to is to activate communities in ways that protect children and guide children and supervise them through the thickets of adolescence and young adulthood. Thank you. Great. So uh, community involvement and cutting off problems before they develop to, to a degree. Uh, and with this, we'll turn it back to uh, here at the table, Dr. Krieger. Dr. Krieger, go ahead. Thank you. So I'm also really glad that this forum is happening, to be here with all of you and to be here with these colleagues. And to build on the comments being made, I come to this as someone, a white person who has devoted my career to addressing issues of how racism harms health. And it's part of what we need to understand so that we can move forward a vision of health equity and a vision in which we can actually have a world in which everyone can truly thrive. And that means a world, of course, in which black lives matter because all lives matter. And I think a really important point to make is that what comes across to me in the pain and outrage in the demonstrations in which I've also been a participant is that the flip side of the pain, the flip side of the outrage is a commitment to dignity, to human rights, to democratic expression, to being fully human, and that's what this is really about. And that's where public health can come in with its view towards prevention. Because we all know that health inequities arise from inequitable conditions in our society about adverse living and working conditions shaped by socioeconomic position and by discrimination. And we know that we literally embody these conditions and that's what creates health inequities. And we know that this happens across the life course and across historical generations. And we also know that we can change this because we've seen change, including in our own lifetimes. Because people can shrink these harms when we mobilize. The issue of police brutality is not new by any stretch. In preparing for today's seminar here, I was looking a lot because I always do at the history and looking at the social history of police brutality, the social history of policing. Going from anything from the original origins of the blue coats was to counter the idea of the red coats in London in the 1800s to show that police were not meant to be a military occupying force, but instead were meant to be a democratically constituted body who would be there to help people protect people from harm, people who take risks bravely to serve communities of which they truly are a part. And that's very different from the other versions of policing that have also been there from the start, which have been to protect privilege, to protect property in this country, Jim Crow, work against working class riots, and otherwise. So these tensions are there in policing as they are in just about every other institution that we have in our society. I want to give two examples from my own work that speak to the pervasiveness of the problem and the possibilities for change. Could we have the first slide, please? Part of my work has been in documenting people's self-reported experiences of racial discrimination, as well as using implicit measures, actually. What this latest slide shows is work that we have here in Boston among members of random sample of uh, members of four community health centers ages uh, 35 to 64, so not typically the people that one thinks about with regard to police brutality in the same way. And what's important to see here in this ex validated measure 
of self-report racial discrimination, you will see that fully 70% of the black men and 31% of the black women report discrimination from police or in the courts. And this is obviously way, way higher than it is for the white people in the study. And this is also runs true for the other examples shown of the kinds of discrimination which are widespread at school, getting a job, at work, getting housing, getting medical care, a store or a restaurant, getting credit, loan, mortgage, or on the street or in a public setting. So these are kinds of questions that I've asked that my colleague David Williams has asked in many of his studies on racial discrimination in health. This is a pervasive problem. Next slide, please. These show work that my team and I have just done to try to actually also begin to give us a historical sense of what the trends are in death by legal intervention, that's death by anyone who's a law enforcement official, whether or not it's justifiable. And there's actually not been much research that's looked at it over the long term. This is 1960 to 2010 for the United States, looking at black and white men ages 15 to 34, who are the age groups most subject. What should stand out are two important findings. One, obviously, the rates have been much higher for black compared to white men. The peak <coughs> difference was in the mid, about 1969. It was a tenfold difference. It's since the 1980s stabilized at about, quote unquote, only three to fourfold, really more about fourfold. Secondly, what's also really striking is how much it's changed. It changes because of both of policies and protests and action by communities that are affected and harmed by this kind of police violence, and it's been reduced. The third thing I'd like to point out is that these are data that are stratified by county income quintile. And what it shows is that unlike many other phenomena that we have where you have health inequities, where you see stark differences by county income quintile, that's not telling the story here. So something else is going on that we really need to pay attention to that's shaping what the risk is. Public health is about understanding risks and it's about prevention. And it's about prevention in a democratically constituted society that's geared to protecting human rights and human dignity. Thank you. Great, thanks, some, some interesting data there. And with that, we'll uh, turn it over to uh, Dr. Williams. Thank you, um, it's really good to be here and I want to, to salute the students um, who have raised their voices and leadership on these questions, as well as the leadership of the school that, that allowed, hosted this um, session today. I want to say three things to put what we are talking about into context. First of all, we need to realize that there is a cancer of racism in our society that is responsible for the deaths of those dramatic cases that we're talking about, but is responsible for deaths of black people on, and other minority people on a massive scale. Today, in America, 265 black people will die prematurely, and 265 more will die tomorrow and every day for the rest of this year. Imagine a fully loaded jumbo jet with 265 passengers and crew crashing every day at Boston Logan Airport. Imagine the uproar that would exist in the United States over that. But that is what is happening every single day in the United States. And the, the higher rates of death reflects a massive inequality in our society that on some indicators of, of inequality are actually growing worse. Today in the United States, black households earn 63 cents for every dollar white households earn, and Hispanic households earn 73 cents for every dollar uh, white households earn. And if you think that's a gaping inequality in income, it's even worse if you look at, at wealth, wealth or financial assets. Today in the United States, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, black people earn six cents for every, have six cents for every dollar of wealth that whites have, and Latinos have seven cents for every dollar of wealth that whites have. To put it into perspective, the black-white gap in wealth in America today is larger than the black-white gap in wealth in South Africa in 1970 on the legally mandated apartheid. And the third point I want to make is that we have to come to grips with the seismic demographic shifts that are taking place in the United States. In 2012, for the first time, the majority of babies born in the U.S. were non-white. It's estimated that in about three years, the majority of Americans under age 18 will be non-white. In 2042, the majority of all Americans will be non-white. So come with me to 2050 in the United States, where two-thirds of persons on Social Security will be white, and where there'll be two workers for every person receiving Social Security benefit. One of those two will be black or Latino. So it is in our collective interest of ensuring our future 
and that there will be resources to maintain the quality of life we know in this country, that we invest in the black and brown children that are growing up in this country, and that we change the current status quo to provide opportunity for all. Fascinating projections. And, uh, and with that, we'd like to show you another clip, uh, this one from a Reuters poll, finding that uh, Americans, many Americans believe that pol police routinely lie, although Americans also tend to approve of their local police forces in, in some cases. Do police officers routinely lie to serve their own interests? An exclusive new Reuters poll showing a surprising number of Americans believe that they do. Reuters opinions editor Jason Fields. One third of all Americans think that the police lie on a daily basis about, you know, to get their own way, uh, to put people in jail, whatever it is that the police are doing, one third of Americans believe that they lie. The poll showing that number higher in certain groups, from 31% overall to 39% of Democrats, 41% of young people, and 45% of African Americans. This lack of trust can fuel outrage following recent instances of police using lethal force. The poll also revealed large gaps in public opinion. Asked if police officers tend to unfairly target minorities, 69% of African Americans said yes, as did 54% of Latinos, but only 29% of whites agreed. But there was widespread agreement on one issue. Nearly three-quarters of Americans approve of the job done by their local police department, including a majority of African Americans, whites, Democrats, and Republicans. An analyst who looked at the data said that it actually made the analogy to Congress, which is that everybody hates Congress in general, but everyone thinks their own congressman is great and uh, therefore, you know, you get 90% incumbency. So in a sense, it's, it's actually a sort of a similar phenomenon. People feel very much more comfortable with their own police department than they do with the idea of law enforcement. Despite months of anti-police protests across the country and surprisingly high levels of mistrust, a majority of Americans still hold favorable views of the police, 59% saying they'd approve of their children becoming police officers. Great. And I think that's um, an interesting segue back into what you, um, you were speaking about earlier, Dr. Uh, Dr. Earls. Why don't you uh, take this back to community policing, please? To reflect on the protest and the basis of the protest and the organization of the protest, because one of the things I'm curious about is whether or not the protests are sufficiently community-based that they become part of the organized response of, of communities over time. I mean, the situation in Ferguson and in Queens seems to have activated uh, groups, and those groups have sustained action over a longer period of time than has been the case in some other uh, examples of police brutality. But the question I have, and this is to some extent a researchable question, but it's also one that I think we can gather from informed opinions of people who know those communities as to whether or not the protests that are going on are igniting a social movement, a social movement which is grassroots-based, it's community-based uh, in a number of areas around the country, um, and hopefully coordinated as time goes forward. So my interest is whether or not the concept of collective efficacy is being operationalized in what we're seeing in communities around the country. And I'm really inspired by the fact that it's young people, for the most part, who are organizing these protests and uh, sustaining the actions that go on, like the student body at the Harvard School of Public Health. Excellent. Um, so, you know, you have a, a nascent movement, well, a long-standing movement, but one that, that it's gotten some energy, um, maybe need for leadership, maybe not. Uh, Dr., uh, Dr. Williams, what can, what can public health bring to this, this discussion? I mean, <clears throat> public health um, can play an enormous role in terms of the leadership that is needed. We now know that in terms of the determinants of health, that where you live, learn, work, play, and worship have more to do with your health than going to the doctor. Going to the doctor is good, but our healthcare system takes care of us once we are sick. Uh, it's a repair shop. The question is, how do we keep people healthy in the first place? So we have to look at how we enhance the quality of individuals' lives in the places where we spend most of our time, our homes, our neighborhoods, our communities. And we need to build structures of opportunity 
to create opportunities for all. One of the things we have missed in the United States, we are, we are thrilled that the, with the civil rights legislation of the 1960s, the doors of opportunity were opened. But it's not enough to open the doors of opportunity. Individuals need to be able to walk through those doors, and we haven't done the investment that we need to en enable individuals to walk through the doors of opportunity. And we, we also um, have failed to come to grips with the truth spoken by Thomas Jefferson when he said, there is nothing so unfair than the equal treatment of unequal people. When we talk about race in the United States, we are talking about unequal people. And equal treatment of unequal people is unfair. Okay, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Krieger, what, what do we? What is the the data that we need? What do, what do we know about this problem? So one of the things from a public health standpoint is that public health is in part about not only prevention but also accountability, and it's actually shocking when I was going through the literature to see how poor the data are that exist on the documentation of both injury and mortality caused by police brutality. That there is a closed shop approach in terms of the code blue, not letting the data out that this is a long-standing historical problem, that there have been commissions dating back to the early 1900s, some good commissions, particularly under LaGuardia in New York City, trying to get the data out there. We, should have, we need to be able to have that data more routinely available because we in public health know that we need to see the data to understand the extent of the problem, to see how we're making a difference in the problem, and to ensure that there's accountability. So you can get data in the, ICE, in the de mortality records about death due to legal intervention. It doesn't have circumstance. There's, an in, there's a unique resource here in Massachusetts, the weapon-related injury surveillance system, but it's actually been having some cutbacks. So it's actually having less data now that it's able to report. But it used to get, it did have some data, not as now in the same way. That's about what the intentions were, what happened at these moments when the weapons were used, when, this, when the assault occurred. So we need to have those kinds of data so that people can understand not only where it's happening, who it's happening, what the circumstances are, and therefore what also can be done to change things. That's part of what public health brings to this picture, a sense of understanding problems to transform them and to change them and to demand that there be justice. And, and maybe uh, that illustrates some shortcoming on the part of government action. I mean, government could provide this data, which, which brings us over to, uh, to you, Governor Doyle. Um, talk a little bit about what, uh, what law enforcement can do in terms of, of training to, to address this issue. Well, let me say I agree completely with Dr. Earls on the importance of community-based and oriented policing. Uh, Madison, Wisconsin was one of the founding places of this and has been at it for uh, probably 30 years now. Uh, I think it really relates to the work that Dr. Williams has done about what neighborhoods mean and community health to try to really work to make police part of the neighborhood and part of the community, uh, to know who the people are, to understand what is going on, to have some sense right down on the street of what's a, who's a good, you know, who's a good kid that maybe did something wrong and who doesn't. So I, uh, and it is too, I agree with some of the earlier comments that community policing kind of morphed into broken windows and it's two very, very different ideas of policing and ones that, uh, I, so President Clinton in his, uh, whatever it was, 100,000 new cops on the street plan tied that very, very directly to the development of community policing. Uh, in, 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 and that's where the money flowed. I was attorney general those years and that's where the money flowed in, in policing was into training and community policing. It is a lot of uh, 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 data that shows that a police officer, the kind of police officer that will be, he, he or she will be, is most influenced by who they train with in the first six months that they're actually out in a squad car with a partner, much more than what's going to be happening in the classroom and how they're taught about things. So there's a lot that has to be done, I believe, at that sergeant level and lieutenant level of real training of officers accountability and contact. I also want to just emphasize as well, I agree completely with the data issue. In my last year as governor, we were able to pass a law that was immediately repealed when my successor came in that required racial data on every stop that police officers made. It took us seven years to get that passed. It took about six months for it to be repealed. But that's the kind of data I think that was very, very instructive to tell people what really is happening. Police are incredibly important. There are wonderful police officers at work 
really giving them the kind of community-based tools to do that job, but also at that first level of supervision. A good sergeant is the most important person, I believe, in a police department. And what that sergeant requires of the officers, the men and women that are under him and her, uh, and the kind of standards they have is critical. So I, I think we have to re-up on community policing in a major way. And I do believe that uh, we have to also focus really on that first level management level in police departments. Great. Um, presents, you know, city level problems. Um, Dr. Harris, what are, what are some approaches that we might take to, uh, to addressing this? Well, a couple of things. One, I want to kind of emphasize that I agree with what's been said about community policing, but I do want to point out <clears throat> that the conversation that we have about public safety has to go beyond policing. And <clears throat> I, I, I actually think the, the conversation about public safety starts with public health. And I, I think we need to think about and understand the way in which uh, uh, priorities are set in this country, the way in which resources uh, are allocated, and, uh, and who, who speaks to that. Uh, you know, I think that, that we begin from a, a premise, unfortunately, in this country, uh, that our entire society, not just our criminal justice system, is based on white lives matter. That is the way the system is developed. So it, whether you're thinking about the death penalty, where the race of victim defines who gets prosecuted, if the victim is white, you get prosecuted. And at the same time, our communities go lacking and, and wanting for resources. And it raises the question, what kind of society are we that makes those kinds of choices? What kind of society are we that chooses to spend the kind of money we do on something like the death penalty while our communities go unserved? So I think the issue and the answer has to do with, it's been intimated here, there, there's a need for a new notion of citizenship as well. I think, you know, on a local level, we see our young people uh, out on the streets acting, voting with their feet, right? In a society in which uh, corporations are viewed as uh, having individual rights within an electoral process, uh, it's kind of, kind of unfair to, to look to uh, people who have been excluded from a process of decision making to start to vote. The, the kind of political engagement we need is the kind that we have going on, and, that's, and the fact is that that's the only way we're going to be able to change the allocation of resources on the local level, on the state level, or on the federal level. Great. And with that, we're going to open this up to some of your questions. Um, we're going to, we have a lot of people watching from outside this room today, so I think we're going to start with uh, some online or from some of our remote locations. That'd be great. Thank you, Scott. Uh, we have questions coming in on email right now and from our live chat. So I'll just share this one. This is from Nicole Williams. I was born and raised in Portland, Oregon. It is a predominantly white city with an almost exclusively, within an almost exclusively white state. Out here, the racism is extremely passive aggressive and deployed in cowardly and covert ways. It is known as Portland polite. Have there been any comparative studies conducted in order to see whether or not covert racism impacts people of color's health differently than overt racism does? I would say that the, there's a lot of research that shows that racism matters in powerful ways for health, both racism that sits in institutional policies that determines access to high quality education, that determines access to employment opportunities, that determines uh, police harassment, as well as racism that exists in the subtle activities of day-to-day -day life. My everyday discrimination scale captures things like in your day-to-day -day life, how often are you treated with less courtesy than others and treated with less respect and receive poorer service and people act like you're not smart or people act as if they're afraid of you. And we find that a re higher levels of those experiences predict um, incident disease, um, the, the progression of cardiovascular disease, and even is linked in some studies to higher rates of mortality among minorities who have those experiences. So discrimination kills regardless of the type. One of the challenges we face is that many individuals who are engaging in discriminatory behavior are not aware uh, that they're actually doing it. It's what we call implicit bias, that the larger negative stereotypes in their minds leads them to take behaviors that are not intentional and, then, and not volitional, but are nonetheless n negative in the consequences for the health and well-being of others. Thank you. That's very interesting. Thank you. Sure. Um, this is a question from our live chat. 
Would any commentators be willing to comment on gun laws and how they might serve as a tool for the reinforcement of structural violence in our communities? Probably everyone would like to. I was looking at you, Governor. <laughs> you can't see that. I, I feel strongly about this, and as somebody who uh, uh, got an F minus repeatedly from the NRA, um, I think one of the things I hope uh, I hope really is studied is the now is this incidence now of greater of these uh, the, the dramatic shootings and others, and how they have how they relate to the loosening of the gun laws over the last five to 10 years across the United States. I vetoed concealed weapon legislation three times in Wisconsin. We were the last state to prohibit the carrying of concealed weapons, which was first prohibited in Wisconsin in 1872. When I left office, it was passed. The new governor did not, you know, sign the bill proudly and we now have concealed weapons. Police officers, have to now consider as they approach these scenes that people have guns it, and they have to consider it in much greater uh, with much greater acuity than they did 5, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, so there is no question and I do believe completely that this is a public health issue. We had an initiative when I was Attorney General to get these small caliber handguns off the streets and it was led by doctors at the Children's Hospital of the, at, in Milwaukee based on the number of instances of kids that they were coming in being shot. That, so there's no quite, I mean, gun violence even classically fits into public, in, into public health. And we have seen massive deregulation of guns over the last 10 years. And I believe now police officers, even if it's not conscious, are dealing in a much more armed society than what they were five or 10 years ago. Yeah, I think that, that's certainly a reality that's feeded, fed into what we've sent, seen. Um, any of you care to join in on that or uh, no? We'll move it on. Okay. Uh, great. With that, let's take a question from the, from the audience here in the room. Hi. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I agree with Dr. Krieger that there is certainly a challenge in the lack of data. Um, but my question really pertains to once we get that data, once we do the analysis, um, and once we determine that these telling and moving statistics, how do we get that information to activists on the ground? Um, how do we make sure that the information um, and the analysis gets out of the academic journals and into the hands of people affecting change in their communities? Thank you. We do it through direct communication with activists and advocacy groups. We know that we have public health agencies that can also get the words out to lots of communities, but it's never meant to be just something that sits in the books. And actually what's also important is that they not be only academic statistics. They need to be publicly available, accountable statistics that are produced in government reports that are accessible to everyone. Because they're not meant to, and they have no fee charges. You can get them <laughs> right off the web. So they have to be available in that way because that's part of what it means to have a democratic discourse. So could I add, of could course. I add the, we at the Houston Institute have a thing that we call Houston Labs and we've been working here in Massachusetts and it's designed specifically to bring together advocates, scholars, uh, policy makers uh, to to think about and absorb the, the data and the information that we do have and be able to translate that into actual mobilizing uh, capacity. And I think it's a, you know, it really is a, is a critical feature of, 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 it's a critical aspect of what we need to be doing today to get, to get these data into the hands of people who can then advocate on their own behalf. And I think, you know, I think you're right. The data aren't designed to sit in journals and sit on the shelves. They're designed to be used uh, by people to determine their own fates. Great. Do we have uh, another remote question that we want to take? Sure, we do. Uh, this is also from our live chat. How can nonprofit public health organizations join this important work? I would say there's work for everyone to do. This is a, this is a war, and and in a in a war, there there are multiple opportunities to become informed, to become engaged, uh, to raise awareness levels, to to advocate at the local level, at the at the national level, um, for for policy changes that make a difference. So there is there is enormous opportunity in in a, a task that is as comprehensive as this one for everyone to become engaged. 
And what I would like to add to that, and where I think, again, a public health lens can be very useful, is that in this country, amongst particularly the white population, there's an enormous denial of the extent to which racial discrimination and racism still happens, and still is harming people's lives in all of the ways that David and others on this panel have discussed it. There was a poll that came out shortly after Obama was elected in 2010 that had 48% of the white population saying that whites are as discriminated against as people of color. Obviously, that doesn't cor correspond to the realities in which people live, but nevertheless, that's a sentiment out there. So how do we bring in a public health perspective? Because I think one thing that happened here at the school with regard to the protests and with regard to the outrage at these killings of unarmed black men was that it broke through a lot of the cant. It broke through a lot of the denial. It opened up an opportunity to talk about racial discrimination and the harm and the pain that it causes. And we need to have that because that's the kind of speaking to the truths that actually can help to heal, can bring people together, that can have people understand their realities. Could I <coughs> possibly modify? Could I just add Sorry. something about nonprofit organizations that uh, both in Sub-Saharan Africa, where I've worked on HIV, and in New Orleans, where I'm now embedded, uh, it's very important that nonprofit organizations collaborate with government. Uh, one of the problems introduced by nonprofit organizations is fragmentation of effort. And the mayor's office in New Orleans, where I'm working now, is got a citywide program called NOLA for Life, New Orleans, Louisiana for Life, which is an anti-violence program, anti program. And one of the important strategies involved in this program is to coordinate the activities of multiple, particularly since, post, since Katrina, many organizations have cropped up in New Orleans, but to coordinate those activities in a way that produces a coherent and impactful intervention. So, so I would, I'd like to modify slightly our thinking here and say <coughs> that uh, we're not at war, we're in need of recovering from a war. <coughs> uh, and, I, and I say that very seriously. And if you think about past wars, you think about what happens following a war, uh, there are massive resources put into rebuilding those communities that have been injured by that war. Uh, and I think uh, the nonprofit sector I is critical in that, in that battle. So the, the issue is, just this week we saw, you know, we, we looked at the budget here in Massachusetts and we looked at where, you know, in this effort to save money, where do we save money? We're saving money in substance abuse, we're saving money in uh, job programs for inner city kids. The question is, what hap how are those nonprofits going to survive? Those nonprofits need funding and resources. It is time for us to, to, to dedicate ourselves and our resources to bringing to scale those nonprofit activities that actually work, that make a difference in our communities, that save lives, that make our communities healthier. It's not, it, and, it, and it does have to do with a matter of resources. We operate through a system of incentives and rewards, and we need to restructure that in a way that the nonprofits that Dr. Earls is talking about are, are in fact funded and can do their work. And so it's a, res it's, a, it's a resource allocation issue, and it's an issue of getting the information necessary to demand that those resources are allocated in the way that we in the communities need them and benefit from them. So prioritization. Uh, I think we have time for, for one more question. Well, I just want to say thank you because we did have uh, another question come in just about that. So thank you for uh, addressing that. Um, <laughs> I know that you all want to make a few final remarks, so I think that we can just proceed. Thank okay. you. Great. Uh, why don't we start with you, Governor Doyle, just a quick policy recommendation. Well, uh, there are obviously no easy answers. Somebody would have figured it out by now, but uh, from the point of view of, uh, I agree completely as well on an emphasis on prevention and community work and supporting nonprofits. Uh, we have seen a large decline in crime rates over the last 20 years. And I think one of the reasons is because there has been so much good work that has been done in communities, boys and girls clubs and churches and other organizations that have worked. In Wisconsin, our level of juveniles incarcerated is half of what it was 15 years ago. Not so good on the adult side, but getting a lot better on the juvenile. So I just think it's a matter of pushing this and pushing it and pushing it on 
on all kinds uh, of, of levels. And I really thank you and thank the great work that the members of this panel and others have done on this issue over the years. Great. Uh, Dr. Earls. I think it's important to cultivate a climate of citizenship, of membership in a great society with responsibilities and human rights that come from a democratic structure. And young black children in the United States have to be incorporated into that identity. Uh, I think far too many children don't think of themselves as members of the society, responsible members of the society who have something to contribute, whose voices are respected and understood. And one of the things we're developing is something called a Young Citizens Program, which is a systematic effort to cultivate this identity in children as young as 8 and 10 years old, so that when they become 18, they're not only electro electoral citizens, they're deliberative citizens. Great. Dr. Harris. Well, I don't know. I might have shot my wad in my last comment. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, but but I, I will say that, that it, I, I believe that we need nothing less than the equivalent of a Marshall Plan in this country. That, 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 and with the same kind of determination and resources we devoted to rebuilding the world after the last war, we need to devote to our cities today. And uh, that means a comprehensive, coherent, strategic focus on getting the resources into our communities that will make us succeed. Great. Dr. Krieger. So to echo in some ways, but also to keep on this point of what's even prompted this discussion today, I'd like to say that within a context of needing broad and integrated policy changes and resources to shrink the vast and rising concentrations of wealth, income, and also corporate power, and to promote instead racial, economic, social, environmental, and climate justice, we need concrete policy change to have every municipality convene local, democratically elected truth commissions that are funded and empowered to hold hearings about police brutality and the social conditions that underlie this corrosive violence so that people can share their stories, put their experiences in context, open the eyes of those who do not have these experiences, and build understanding that can lead to better policies as part of building an engaged and fair democracy, which is a theme that we keep hearing from everyone on this panel today. And secondly, again, that there needs to be mandated routine collection and public reporting of public health data on deaths and injuries caused by police violence. And these data must be stratified by race, ethnicity, immigration status, gender, including transgender, as well as age and socioeconomic position. And that's so that we can have community-wide understanding of the extent of the problems, the trends over time, and what must be done to change them. Great. Dr. Williams. In 1899, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote a book entitled The Philadelphia Negro. He wrote, devoted a chapter in that book to Negro health. And he said in that chapter, the most difficult social problem in the matter of Negro health is the peculiar attitude of the nation towards the well-being of the race. And Du Bois continued that there have been few other cases in the history of civilized peoples where human suffering has been viewed with such peculiar indifference. That peculiar indifference is the biggest single challenge we, we face. There is no emotional concern. There is no political will. There is no interest to doing something about the challenges we're talking about. And we can make a difference. We can be leaders. We can raise awareness levels. We can tell the story of the challenges of the populations we care about in a new way, tell a new narrative that people can connect with, can emotionally identify with, and can be mobilized to get up and do something about it. The American people are a kind, generous people, and we have to find new ways to communicate to them of the challenges that we face and how we can get them motivated, involved, so that we can create the political will that we need to make the policy changes that will make a difference. Powerful words, and that's uh, as appropriate an ending to our event as we could have, I think. Um, this has brought our forum to, to an end, although the conversation can continue online, and I would encourage both people here and, and people participating remotely to do so. Um, thank you all very much for your time.